When I saw so few people, uh, I was at the first round of sitting this morning, I thought, why hold a talk? Maybe we'll, we'll just start right into a dialogue together. And then remembered uh, someone who came for the first time last Sunday, telling me how helpful it is before a group dialogue to have some focus, the mind having some focus. So in letting come into the mind what will, what did come up again as in the last three meetings and during some private meetings the past week is this whole question of well, what is it? Of sorrow? Of violence? Human misery taking place right now as we are watching news, reading papers, hearing the radio, focused specifically on Kosovo, the unending train of refugees. People who have nothing, nothing left. not even identity papers. The traumatic losses of family members. The total exhaustion of walking one knows not where to. From one hostile place to another that will not accept one. And then during one of our group dialogues, someone mentioning, and that, that happens, that comes up very frequently, why be so concerned about that war far away? Don't we have it right here in ourselves, in our midst? And if there's any place to do work, isn't it here? in the disorder of our emotions, our reactiveness, which may not be so different in quality, even though different in quantity from the misery created elsewhere. I just wanted to say one thing, which may not be connected to the rest. It is often said, oh, these are just things brought to our attention by the media. They select what we are to become emotional about, agitated, political about. And that may be true to a certain extent, but what these pictures or these reports depict is something that is happening. Even though we're not there. These pictures speak for themselves. They need no interpretation. And the mind, particularly when it is situated here in Western New York, Comfortably, all of us are comfortable, well fed, not torn apart, our families. Maybe by internal conflict, yes, we'll come to that later. These pictures speak to us. 
need not be interpreted. There is something self-evident. It's not a stage play. And having lived a bit through a war and bombings myself, and the horror of it, the, the, the scariness of it, the fear, the trauma of it, I'm amazed how these journalists make it in those countries, in those fields of suffering. And you don't just see sensationalism painted on their faces. This morning, um, just before turning off the radio after listening to the news, there was going to be a, uh, an interview of, of a church person or Christian priest or minister. The topic was going to be, is there such a thing as a just war? I was getting ready. I, I, I was just, the mind didn't want to take in anymore with the preparation for breakfast and, and, and so forth, getting dressed, getting ready. So I don't know what, what point of view was taken, whether there's such a thing as a just war, just violence, just anger, justified anger. We're talking about this in the, the article in this new, new newsletter, spring newsletter. Is there such a thing as justified anger? Is what uh, was told to us by the teacher at the Zen Center in preparation for taking the precepts, one of which in Buddhism is not to be angry, to control anger. And then there was this side remark by the teacher that there are, there are justified angers, righteous angers, righteous wars. <clears throat> and as you think about it with the thinking mind, People in this case in Kosovo, for the second, for the second time in a short period, within a year, thrown out of their homes, driven into the mountains along the railroad tracks. With children and babies, old people not even able to walk. Then can the mind justify bombing, doing violence to the perpetrators? Maybe not bombing them directly, but in all bombing there are misplaced bombs. It's impossible to just pick out the military target, and the military target was probably manned or womaned by someone who has assigned duty there to watch over the bridge, the, the, the ammunition factory and so forth, to work there. So uh, the mind here can make a case for to stop this, we have to stop them. And the mind thought, image, based on memory, anticipating future results, paints itself a scenario, a successful scenario, which as we all know right now didn't, didn't happen there in, in Kosovo. Just the opposite seemed to have happened. Although we, we don't know that either because there was going to be another offensive onto these people as there was last year driving them out, clearing the country for new occupants, getting rid, of, getting rid of the problem by eliminating what one thinks are the problem makers.
reminiscent of what happened in Germany and other countries. Fo fo focusing on the one who is the problem, the troublemaker, the venom, the venom. And if we only got rid of them, we would have it all right for ourselves. Which is very watchable in oneself, isn't it? Maybe not in action, but in thoughts. If only could get rid of this rival in my relationship, then I would be all right. I'll get rid of this person who is such a nuisance at work. If we could eliminate this person, then we would have peace. Then we could uh, be better off. Happens to us very frequently. It is observable and needs to be observed ever more carefully, attentively, not in order to eliminate those reactions, but to be intimate with them, to understand them all the way through. So the, is there a just war? El eliminate them so we will have peace or eliminate the oppressor so there will be peace. Or the means that the oppressor uses, in this case we feel we're doing a very careful job, we meaning the, the NATO people, to avoid what is called collateral damage. These words are amazing. To not get one to really get in touch with what's happening. But Things in this life do not work out the way the mind paints it, pictures it, imagines it, plans it. One, one movement, one action, has infinite real, uh, results, side actions, consequences, infinite. You start, in this case, you, you plan on bombing the Serb military machine you have to take the people out whom you don't want to be hit, the observers, the journalists. And all of a sudden there is no one to report or to witness or to send pictures and reports home about what is happening. Which gives new freedom license to the aggressor, the present time aggressor. Less obvious, but, but it can be counted on probably with mathematical certainty, is what is just to one is unjust to the other, whether, whether it's bombing the military machinery or, or uh, evacuating or cleansing, ethnically cleansing people out of a country. It all has psychological consequences in the recipient of the aggression, of the action, of the reaction. There, through all of these just, in quotation marks, attacks, sanctions, whatever all is being done to keep order on this earth <coughs> breeds hatred, desire for revenge. And not just desire for it, eventually this desire will come to fruition. And so we find ourselves in a constant chain reaction of violence. Now, 
coming back from the very general. Oh, nothing is so general that it cannot, if we're interested, be observed in oneself or at least question, is there such, such a thing going on on a small scale in myself, in relationship with my family, my co-workers, the people of a different ethnicity or race, my reactions, my views, not in a fault-finding mission, but to, to air, to bring to light, to discover how we are without intending to be so. Our intention is to be good, to be just, be fair, to be nice, to be peaceful. So, you, you can convince yourself or your audience, maybe, maybe not, but the attempt is made all the time that there is such a thing as justified violence, justified anger, justified war. And yet, what are we saying? What are we omitting? What are we ignoring? The, the sowing of seeds for the next aggression, for the next anger in reverse. And in, in one discussion the other night in the apartment, I, I did say that being part of a, a semi-Jewish family and that it wasn't only the Jewish or part Jewish families who were longing for liberation from this deadly yoke which, which led nowhere except to more destruction, destruction of people, country, longing for victory of the Allies to liberate us from this. And it happened. Often this, this war is, is cited as a just war because it ended this rule of the Third Reich there. So were there seeds of revenge sown which are still sprouting and growing further seeds, further sprouting. Was it worth it? At a time when these American soldiers on their jeeps moved into the, the city where I was living, there was nothing but joy and relief. And the amazing thing, the country that lay so thoroughly in ruins, you wouldn't know it now. which gives one this kind of question. Is this just an in inevitable movement of living as a human being, as part of nature, the animals, the plants, the planets, the solar systems? This cycle of destruction 
and new creation, regeneration. That one just watches, one doesn't fight it, one doesn't excuse it. It's just an ongoing affair. This is sort of taking a very vast view, which one can feel sort of eliminates this compulsion to take sides, to do something about something or against something. And let these forces take their course, which they do anyways. We just kid ourselves when we think we are the doers of it. Find the doer. So after having rambled on for a while. We will start talking with each other, raising questions or making comments, or sitting quietly. I feel very released lately from the war. I don't have TV, so I don't see the what's going on. I don't read papers. 
Well, yesterday, a man and his son helped me install a sign which I had promised months ago and I couldn't do because of my broken arm. And he's a religious kind of Christian that educates his kids at home and his son works, has been working with him since he was 14. And he's like, this, he looks like the, the picture of health, just bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, except it's a bushy, big black beard. And he's so efficient and capable. I always, you know, love to see him. But he's also very... <laughs> Once he asked me what I thought Jesus looked like, and I thought, well, I think he looks, probably looked a lot like you. Because he looks Semitic, maybe, you know, it could be Semitic. But he interpreted that to mean that he is like Jesus. <clears throat> he says, oh, I'm glad you said that, because I like to think that I act like, try to act like Jesus. And so when he was, uh, we were, uh, he said he could give me two hours. And I said, yeah, we should be able to install that in two hours. So it was already like 11 o'clock. We were still working on installing the sign. And uh, he said, what time is it? I went and checked it out. So I started feeling bad because he wanted, they wanted to go to some family thing by around noon, I forget what exactly. So he said, yeah, we better hurry. So I started taking over and saying, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and yelling louder and louder, trying to make it happen, 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 happen. <laughs> I got all, all excited because of my fear that he would be really put out by losing his time with the family. And uh, <laughs> I started really talking loud. And, and he looked down and said, Church, calm down, okay? And I realized that he was feeling like he was looking like the, a lackey that I was yelling at. I was the boss and he was just some guy and him, his son. Or something like that. But anyway, I could tell that he was angry that I was yelling. And I think in the past, if, if that happened, I would always, at that point, I would feel, I would have from then on felt disturbed, worried about, you know, the consequences, how you would feel in the future, and uh, now he's going to be mad at me always, forever, and uh, what do I owe him because of this, I've messed up his day, all this and that. But once we were done, I said, I said okay, I was just worried about you getting to your family and thing. He said, well, I'm not worried about it. And when we were done, I said, Thanks, you saved me. He said, well, Tersh, remember, Jesus saves. <laughs> I am just the instrument of the Lord. He's a realist, he said. He's a, he's a sanctimonious ass. <laughs> but at the same time, I understand his, his wanting to be that. I want to be that too. I want to be that wonderful instrument of the Lord, you know. And <laughs> but then I, I felt like I saw in his, the way he treats his son, you know, he was, he was Malachi. Come on, you're not doing this right. Come on, work. You know, start, stop getting distracted. It was like a different side of him that I had never seen. Um. But I was just, I just felt, it 
so great. It was like, you know, I thanked them with real uh, gratitude because they really saved me. And, and I got my sign up, which the person likes a lot, and everything is great. And, uh, and I think that they, they felt that I wasn't trying to push them around or anything. And, and, it, and it felt like a clean resolution. some kind of, there was a sense of, or I felt a sort of sense, relief isn't the right word, but you know, relaxation or something. I'm not sure. Relief, relaxation, letting go. Because I think, I mean, I think there's this idea that, um, I know Mary, you were talking about it the other day in the meeting, it's just this idea that we should be able to do something. Violence in our cities, the violence in ourselves, violence in, in the wars. The, um, and I mean, by doing something, I mean by doing something, some sort of control or some sort of conscious volition to make things different. And um, you know, maybe that's as much. Maybe that's as much of a, a, a part of the keeping the whole thing going in some way too, um, yeah. rather than just. I don't mean accept it by saying that it's like okay, or not doing anything, but that that. Um, for instance. Well, I'm not even sure. It's that, that what one might do besides seeing it, you know, here. And, and well, maybe that's it. It's seeing it here, and that's where, wherever we are, when that appears, when the violence appears, when the, con the control, when the pushing, and the pulling, and the conflict is, is to just respond. In, in, there. So if we were in Kosovo, or if we were um, filling out our tax forms even here, um, m maybe then something appears that is, is some sort of unattached um, response to the situation. But that, but that a lot of times, I know for me, I get this idea that I should be doing something. Not unlike Mary, it's like, you know, we should be out in the trenches, we should, you know, I should be, um, you know, out making speeches or something, and, um, or in the inner cities. And, um, instead of just kind of, instead of just watching it and responding in a place where, you know, just in it right now or what, with whatever's happening. And is this responding out of watching a totally different action from these chain reactions of anger and anger again? Or I may control my anger for a moment, but then it comes out against somebody else. Is this a response of watching a, a completely different action, which does not 
have seeds of perpetuation. Now, wait a minute. I mean this reaction, counter reaction, counter reaction, that, that kind of seeding. It, it may be that a response coming out of watching or beholding the whole thing cha changes something, not, not, not with intent, but it so happens. And one can, one can watch this in oneself if there is really observing anger, watching it without this intention to do something about it, to control it, to subvert it, or to justify it. And one also sees what, what keeps feeding it, namely the headlines about myself and him, or her, and abstaining from feeding out of seeing. The abstaining of feeding the anger out of seeing is already a new action, isn't it? And that has an amazing effect, or may have an amazing effect, of this anger evaporating and making room for presence and a change of mood, like the sun coming through the clouds. Is it possible that the media attention in Kosovo and other places where there is a conflict and a lot of suffering, that media attention kind of grips, 
grips our attention and perhaps the world's attention and brings it into focus, brings it into awareness and makes us deal with it on one level or another. Maybe we're not there helping people or totally in contact with it, but on a certain level we do absorb it and try to understand it. And this is going on all over the world, really. And, I mean, in terms of coming to awareness, is, is this another part of the whole thing? I mean, there are so many things that go on that we can't know their effects, but maybe this is, the world hasn't learned the lesson yet. Perhaps it will. I mean, we, we learn more and more about natural phenomena, about weather. There's probably no reason why we can't learn more and more about the things that cause, cause war and the way people react and that sort of thing too. But how are you going to learn it? It's there. You watch it, you look at it. You watch it. And, and do you watch it as something happening, happening in the world, out there? Perhaps on a certain level, yeah. But I mean, let's say there, there are those who feel that they're calling, or they're, there's something there that makes them pay particular attention. And they may be a journalist, they may be in the Red Cross, they may be in European community doing this sort of thing and, and maybe they're the people who are uh, bringing the information to the rest of us. I mean, is it really necessary for all of us to um, be the arms and legs of, of this, this bigger mind that we can share? I didn't quite under, understand the last question well, by being the arms and legs, meaning there. going there or... Yeah, there, I mean, you, you said, well, it's out there in the world, away from us, but on the other hand, there are people just like us who are, it's not out there because they're over there. Yes. And we can certainly identify with, with that sort of thing, and also through their, through their actions and efforts, maybe misdirected at times. Um, then that, that's also a way for us to not distance ourselves from it. I mean, and how, how do we ultimately or fundamentally not distance ourselves from, from it? What, what is maybe, that Well, maybe we, we do it, maybe we don't. I mean, but maybe it's a process. What is a process? No distance? Just coming to awareness of of how things, how things happen. Yes, that now we know more about this. We never used to know before these, all of these electronic media and the world looks horrible, but it, it was always like this, but we know more about it now. Yes. But what is the, what is the fundamental, fundamental factor of not being distanced from it all? And by that I don't mean bridging the 3,000 miles or so and going there. You may be over there and still be distant, separate, feel separate from it. Well, I mean, in, in a sense, one answer would be that we understand the causes in ourselves. the anger and the way we, we react towards other people and the misunderstandings and that sort of thing. And we can understand that that whole process is not separate from ourselves. But are you, are you looking for something else? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just asking. And, and, uh, see, one, one can put this all out, write a dissertation about how all the processes that go on ourselves and they, they really also go on 
in, 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 in nations and in, in, in collision of, of, of countries, ethnic groups and so forth. And to, to sort of have the information, psychological information, sociological, historical, political, etc. And we, we are getting more and more and more information on, on, on everything. Is that enough? to end separation. Of course, you could say now, you, you, you Tony, seem to be assumed that ending separation is the sine qua non. It's the thing that has to happen. And that may still be a concept, right? Okay. But, Going into it, and we'll start maybe from the concept of no separation, but isn't all conflict clashes in families, in, 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 among ethnic groups, among countries, isn't it all because we feel separate from one another? And, and, and <coughs> implied in, in that is usually I'm better and they're worse. Sometimes it's I'm, they're better and I'm worse. This, this assumption of there being me and them, or us and them, which is deeply programmed into this organism. And, and we're just questioning that assumption, whether that's accurate. Even though there are dark skins and light skins and, and different colors and kinks in the hair and what have you, and people praying to different gods and different buildings, and that's, that's all happening. And with it, some mechanism of defending and attacking and feeling attacked. Could, could we say, and this may just be conceptual, may not be, could we say that as long as there is the conviction of separation, me and you, us and them, operating in human beings like you and me, There is no peace, harmony. Now you, 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 you're saying maybe by finding out more how similar people are really, in spite of all our different habits, maybe by finding that out, some of this those barriers melt. Is, is that so? Does that happen? I mean, does, does information help in this process, as you say, it's a process? I don't know. And can you give some something uh, for myself personally, personal? I say yes, but I, I think most people don't pay any attention for very little. You, so you mean by personally informing yourself of, of being informed through whatever means? Yeah. There is a lessening of separate feeling of separation. Sometimes. Last year, or actually during 
decades of learning is that he's been uh, an instrument of the CIA sending propaganda, <coughs> anti-communist propaganda for all his life. And meanwhile, he's a bleeding heart liberal, consciously, on a conscious level, but he's been helping the forces of money. And the reason is, he, he sees the variety of people. He appreciates, you know, the, the Cossacks and the White Russians and the Tartars and all different kinds of people, but he sees them only as like uh, decorations or uh, characters. And he knows a lot. He knows a, a, a human, a humongous amount. I mean, like he, he'll tell me about the history of the Albigensians and how they were wiped out in France. And I, and I think, wow, you know, that's the kind of thing I, I like to know. Well, why does he, he does? He has no interest in the fundamental beliefs of these people, of their what they were trying to achieve in their religious life. He's just interested in the whole show, in the whole. The, the, the colorful, that's so colorful and dramatic. But, and what I realized last, this last year is that he's never, his conscience is not capable of working. His con he has a conscience, he <coughs> feels that everybody should be treated equally, but when he goes out there, he does what, what he subliminally knows, his, uh, the people who pay his check want him to do. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's, uh, it's all in the mind, in the mind there's these beautiful ideas, and in the action there's something else. And so it is for most of us, or all of us, because it's very, very, very difficult or elusive to become aware of yourself in the subtle movements. Because we take them so for granted, they've been there all the time. We don't feel them, we don't hear them and see them. It's not necessarily so, but it, it, it works this way. I mean, it, it can change, but it, it takes the subtlest kind of awareness for the subtlest kind of movements of habit, which we're as used to as our skin. It really takes an incredible, unattached listening, an unidentified listening, to hear, hear oneself, observe oneself. One man who has been coming to retreats since Zen Center days, he's been recently observing to his utter dismay how prejudiced he is. He says, it's, I find, if I, as I enter a bus in the city where he works, I'm counting the non-white people. And in up comes a feeling, they are taking over our country. And maybe not as... As, as, as poignantly expressed as this, but he said, I'm counting how many non-whites are here. I was never aware of this, this going on. And he, he works with, he said, I would never <coughs> hurt one, but there is such ingrained stuff about these Orientals, these blacks, these whatever all is in his bus. <laughs> Then, of course, the next question is, what can I do about it and feeling oneself despicable, which is not the, the, the right response, like Arida was getting into there. To really keep observing it and remaining with the observation, with the breadth and width and depth of it, and let this other stuff reveal itself. And reveal itself as an instrument of separation. Not judging, it, it, it reveals its soul. If I think that I, I think I'm better and uh, taking over my country, what is my country? To, to sort of allow questions to bubble up and illuminate the landscape. And 
the way he put it, he said, have I been doing this for 20 or some odd years to just <coughs> still be a prejudiced person? But maybe it takes 20 odd years for this stuff to really penetrate in, into awareness, that this is what the mind is busy with. And that's only possible if you're not already so clinging to your view that you are not prejudiced, that you love all people of all nations or ethnicity, then you don't see that. But when those things break down, those, those images about oneself, then what comes into view is the movements of the mind, which are in separation and prejudice, and me better than you, and, and the security, the pseudo-security of it. To, to let it all surface and be, be viewed spaciously. The importance is the space, not what it is that is being viewed. Seems like it's pretty, pretty tough when it's all on the level of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've noticed lately um, uh, getting this attitude about the bad guys and how horrible they are. And then I see a picture in the paper um, of the bad guy suffering, you know. And, and, you know those judgments just um, you know, are seen for what they are. And, but it's um, what does it is just um, about compassion, I guess. It just the barrier is dropping. Seeing that we're all, we're all the same, we all suffer, we all feel joy. this compassion. two rude, crude dudes that I had to work with who wanted to kill me. And there it was getting worse and worse and I had to get them to polish pieces of the things I was building. And uh, I was like, hell, trying to get them to come over and do anything for me. It got to the point where they were yelling across the room, 
those 50 guys working in one former skidding rink, and they would yell across the room, I'm going to cut his head off. I couldn't understand. I was making excuses for them. They don't have the education. They, don't, they didn't have love. They don't have, they're, they're breathing all this. They, they're on the lowest rung of the work order. They have to breathe all this stuff when they're polished, and they're in a bad mood all the time. And I would smile at them and try to pacify them. <laughs> I finally had to set a confrontation because I couldn't work right. <clears throat> and I thought they were going to be even more mad at me. So I sat down and tried to meditate and prepare it to be calm for the confrontation. And, but my mind was going, why did they want to kill me? Why did they hit me? Why did they hit me? And finally, I realized, because they can tell I think I'm better than they are. So then when I saw them again, it was all gone. I said, well, can you come polish my hood? And they said, yeah, right away, Dirk. <laughs> and we were great friends from then on. Almost 20 years, I knew that everybody's one and nobody's better than anyone else, but it took people wanting to kill me for me to really realize it. Seems clear that all these ideas of how things are supposed to be, no matter whether they are our own little fears or dreams or on a little scale, it always, it's supposed to be this way. It just always gets in the way. It does, doesn't it? So it's a puzzle to shift out of that with the way things are, into, with the, into how, it, how things really are. To notice the discrepancy, this is how it ought to be, it's not so, and the conflict, all the effects of that, anger, frustration, malaise, and noticing it and wondering whether it's possible to, to shift out of that discrepancy, out of that mental st construct. 
with its physical stuff into being with the way things are. From the abstract to the concrete. And you start here. Right now. Maybe thought says, I ought to be with things the way they are and see it as a thought. And hear the fan or the bird calling, the breathing. All the thoughts that may be there or may not be there. And think nothing of it. Just let it flow. With what? survivors who survived only because they stood and watched. One man describing how he watched men kill his entire family and did nothing to resist it because he, he said it was not as part of his Buddhist philosophy. He just accepted what was happening for what he said it was. So his whole family was killed but he survived to tell the story. But when does one interfere? If he'd interfered, he probably would have been killed. Maybe, maybe action comes when you're not within the Buddhist philosophy or, or any other philosophy, but exactly. just was, present. Does action was do nothing. Yeah, but that's an, that was an idea for him? I don't know. I, it sounds like way to me, yeah. Yeah. Because... Maybe, uh, hmm? maybe that was the right action for him and all his family was all killed. Do we look at him and say, he should have done this, we should have done that? Some more ideas. It's what? It's more ideas. Some more ideas. You you have to find out for yourself the amazing phenomenon that presence awareness has its own action, which does not come out of a philosophy. Seeing, awareing has its own action, which may be doing something or doing nothing, and that action, when it comes out of presence, awareness, is compassionate. And let it, let it act. There is no one doing it. It comes out of... It, it's the totality of the situation responding in awareness, out of awareness. In itself, it seems enough. 
I don't know what that's enough. What is enough as measured by whom? <laughs> but on a larger scale, it seems too many skills make a difference. You mean a scale like uh, something going on on the other side of the world? Yeah. You can't. Yeah. Exactly. We don't know. Well, we will always sit around not knowing other people are dying. Why do we think we have to know? I didn't say we had to know. Mm -hmm. You said we didn't know. We, we don't know if our actions are enough or not. I mean, we don't know if our actions are enough right in this room. Or our inactions. Or inactions. And look at the mess we made there, right? <laughs> By trying to do something. I just recently saw a picture, huge warehouse, it was either in Honduras or Nicaragua, with all these clothes that people had sent, and gifts, I mean, people had just given from their heart, and there they were sort of rotting away. Because there were no, no bridges, no highways. Um, and yet, some things are, are happening again, you know, just like on Mount St. Helen. Uh, I remember seeing a picture of the first little sprout of a, of a tree on that ashen slope. Camera zeroing in, zeroing in on it, you know, all this gray stuff, and here's a little green branch. You mentioned a little bit earlier that time that I had a person speaking of her directly observing um, one's own prejudice, but 
just sort of even on a broader scale, I can't, can't help thinking about when we think of uh, ethnic prejudice in all of this country, certainly. Uh, you know, when you consider what has gone on up until fairly recently, you know, the, until the civil rights movement, which wasn't all that long ago, um, and somebody just recently, because they were the wrong color in the wrong spot, the wrong time, 40, 40 some odd dollars. I mean, um, I mean, it's right here. I mean, right here. <laughs> and right here. Uh, ethnic prejudice and uh, division. I mean, I don't think it would take very much for. We talk, or you know, we talk about the absence of me, <clears throat> and I've, I've been noticing lately just how incredibly, I mean, it's kind of amazing to me that we don't have more wars and violence than we do sometimes because I can just see this me and the tiniest, the tiniest um, incursion on this me, you know, and I have to do something. I mean, it can be something like somebody taking a little bit too much water to pour tea with and maybe I won't get enough from my teacup. And I can say, wow. And it's like, I mean, you know, I just see it and I say, wow. <laughs> you know, or, or maybe, you know, I put something down somewhere or something, somebody moves it someplace else. Or, uh, just the smallest thing, you know, and it's, it's me. It's so ready to go bonkers, you know. Like, uh, and, you know, and then I think, well, you know, here I'm in sort of a space where there's, you know, it's a little bit slow and I can maybe see some of the stuff. But when, you know, you're out there and kind of where it's a lot busier, and it's like, you know, this, this action, reaction, action, reaction. And these challenges to this me are just like kind of continual. And, uh, and so, in some ways, it's really surprising that we don't have more violence in the world. Sense of ourselves is so so concrete, or so and so sort of unoblivious, sort of unseen. And, um, you know, it's amazing. I was kind of thinking of that actually. Uh, kind of came from what Carl, Carl from was talking. What Carl was talking about when he said that when he said that. It, um, Sometimes, like when the media um, brings the information, or when you get the information, then you it reduces separation. And I guess I, I just had a question because I, I mean, I've been kind of just sitting with that because I can remember as I started to know people from other countries, and then the other country, something might be threatening in that other country, it really changed my um, sense of what of that threat because I knew people in that country, but suddenly the country wasn't just some color on a map someplace, you know. But they were like actual human beings in this country. But then, I, but then the question is, is that because then is, I mean, how much of that is then this I is identified with this person that I know, and so I don't want them to be hurt. And, um, anyway, that was just, I was just kind of wondering about that, I guess. So I, and, and in fact, does that allow this um, spaciousness? I mean, is that really just because suddenly, you know, there's this connect, a personal connection of some sort? Um, I'm not sure that necessarily makes this, for the spaciousness of this, um, acceptance or the, the not on a deeper level. Anyway. Not on a deeper level. <coughs> is that what you said? Yeah. <coughs> Because this man said that, he says, I have lots of friends, black friends, I work with them. Uh, but this other mechanism is sort of humming along. <clears throat> but being detected, see, his, his 
thought then was it shouldn't be humming along anymore because I have lots of black friends and, and don't mind being with them at all. I like them and we invite each other. So the assumption is now this mechanism should be gone. Maybe a better question is how to become aware of this without getting oneself down, you know, blaming oneself. Or, but just to see it for what it is, namely a, a conditioned reflex, like the dog salivating when the bell rings. No, no one's fault, it is how this um, system works. Sort of have a, a wise, compassionate view of it. So the moment it rears up, ah, oh, yeah, I know that, and be done with it. Rather than falling into dismay over oneself. And that, that, that lends credence to this prejudice, as though it was something real. It's just a habit. And it's not our fault that it's there. It's so, been, been out there and pounded into us. Into us. Maybe it's even genetic to, to look for who looks like you and be afraid or suspicious <clears throat> of someone who looks different because they may be against me. Maybe, it's, maybe there's something in the genes about it. Would that, yeah. Maybe not. It's just a, a question. Because there are cases where, where kids grow up mi mixed <laughs> and obviously is not, is not dominating there. <clears throat> so you mean a genetic, like something safety in a tribe yeah. or something? It doesn't even seem its looks because um, okay. you know, every wave of immigrants who came into this country, many of great many of them were from like different countries in Europe and each I mean, they didn't look different particularly. They had different habits, maybe different cultures, but they were still the same violent happened to the same colour. So. Yeah. So recently on the news, it was about one of the big universities, I don't know whether it was Yale or where um, they were showing how black people with great joy and energy and enthusiasm have their own bus stops now. They have arranged for that, the students. That's called the black stop or the black bus stop. And um, that's where they get on the bus. And only they, but, but, but it was initiated by uh, the black community at, at, at this university. And in being interviewed, they were very free and open to say, well, because the interviewer said, well, first you were fighting to be accepted in a white university, and now you do this. They said, yes, we want the freedom to be in this university, but we love to be among each other. Because there's a lot of information comes in there probably too about this kind of still prevalent prejudice against each other. But um, they weren't particularly defiant or they just said we want to be with each other. We, uh, but we want to have the freedom to be wherever we, we want to study. And it made perfect sense. This is how they, how fe how they feel. Um, 
We, we don't even know how it feels to be a, a minority of a handful of students in a big, or a handful of people in a big country. And what all is triggered by that? So then, it's it's a challenge to, 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 to get in touch with that, to feel it out. Not say they shouldn't be like this, but how, how does it feel? Didn't you say once when you were in India or so, or in, in this <coughs> ashram, or that you were the only one who didn't speak English, and you said, yeah, now I know how it feels. I was the only one who spoke English, everybody else was speaking Hindu, Hindi. We all knew English, but they were speaking English. Yeah, nah. And I was invited to a party over in Geneseo on campus by a friend. When I got there, I was the only white person there. And they got into a big argument right in front of me amongst themselves about not wanting white people at their party. My friend had to take me out. <laughs> Racism is everywhere. It's completely universal, individually and collectively. There seems to be no stop to it. Not for very long. Yeah. So how, how can we get a handle on it? Since it is universal, since it may be genetic, and who knows what all, to, to, to let it be and yet not be uh, caught up in this, finding it in oneself or in others, just to see this is how, how it, it works. To, to be larger than that. Without becoming somebody special again. It, it isn't like that. 